Well, welcome everyone to the, uh, the teaching on 1 Peter Lesson 9, Leadership and Humility. Um, hey, before I get uh, started, I wanted to make a couple of announcements, okay? Um, well, the first one is just a big word of thank you to all of you who uh, supported uh, me and the teaching directors who uh, were at a uh, gathering all together for our zone out in a little town called Twainheart. And I'll tell you, it was, uh, it was really a wonderful time. There were 21 of us all totaled. Um, in terms of um, teaching directors, there were 12, uh, and the remainder were area directors and, um, and our zone director. I mean, we had a great chance to relax, uh, share stories, uh, uh, talk to each other about our classes, and just kind of spend time uh, dwelling in the Word and with the Lord and with each other. So it was a fantastic time, and I thank each of you uh, for contributing uh, uh, to defray the expenses to, to go there and have this put on. So thank you. Regarding registration for next year, some of you have asked about that, and um, I just wanted to say that we'll be uh, opening registration um, very, very soon just in the coming days. We're just settling now the final uh, breakout of our classes and when they're going to meet and so on and so forth. So that'll happen very shortly. And I'll be sending out a separate announcement on that just as a reminder. Uh, and then I wanted to ask you all to share the date, okay? Um, Thursday, May 4th, 5.30 p.m. to 7 uh, that will be our sharing day, and this is going to be an in-person event, um, and we're inviting everyone to come. Um, it'll be held at the First Presbyterian uh, Church in Concord. This is the place where the Concord Eve class has uh, typically met over all the years and past. Food will be provided, and uh, we'll have a time for fellowship, singing, um, you know, a couple of announcements, followed by sharing time where you will have a chance to share um, your thoughts on the study and how God's Word uh, has been transformative in your life. Okay. Uh, oh, and I will send another announcement out about that separately as well. So don't worry, you don't have to take notes on that. Okay. So uh, one day, uh, a wealthy man uh, took his son on a trip to the country so he could have his sons see how poor country people were. And they stayed one day and one night at the f farm of a very humble farm family. Well, when they got back home, the father asked the son, well, what did you think of the trip? Well, the son replied, very nice, Dad. Hmm. Dad says, well, did you notice how poor they were? Yes. Well, so what did you learn from the trip then? He says, well, I've learned that we have one dog in the house, and they had four. We have a fountain and some imported lamps in our garden. They have a stream with no end and the stars in the sky. Our garden goes to the edge of the property, and they have the entire horizon as their backyard. Well, at the end of this, the uh, son's <laughs> father was speechless. And then the son said, thank you, Dad, for showing me how poor we really are. So, welcome to the final teaching on 1 Peter. This is a letter he authored to the suffering believers in the northern part of Asia Minor. It was written about 66 AD, a mere 33 years following Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, in his letter, uh, Peter's covered several truths uh, because believers are in Christ, they've been born again to a living hope through Christ's resurrection. They suffer for him and are grieved by various trials, and they can endure those trials because he did. And they are built together into a living house, a, a holy priesthood of God. And they can be holy the way the Father is holy and hold back from the passions of the flesh that war against their souls. And they rejoice in sharing in Christ's suffering and will rejoice when his glory is revealed. And because they are in Christ, after all, they've suffered, God himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, 
and establish these believers in Jesus for all eternity. Now, you don't have to take notes on that list. I took it from the recap at the end of the lesson commentary. So be sure to read it. It will sound very familiar to you. Okay, so here's the outline I'll be using. Um, verses 1 to 5, be humble to one another. Verses 6 to 11, be humble before God. And then 12 to 14, be humble in all circumstances. So, okay, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5 and follow along. Now, in this first section, verses 1 to 5, Peter appeals to the church elders to be shepherds of God's flock under their care. He gives them some do's and don'ts and tells them if they follow his instructions, they will receive the crown of glory from the chief shepherd. And he also appeals to the young men and those which should be submissive to those that are older. Well, Peter then addresses everyone, telling them to clothe themselves with humility, reminding them that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So, you know, what's kind of going on here? Uh, the Life Application Study Bible begins by explaining a few things, um, and a few things that we all know about Peter, and then adds a compelling observation at the end. You know, Peter was one of 12 disciples. He was one of the three who saw Jesus' glory at the Transfiguration. Peter was the chief spokesman for the apostles. He'd witnessed Jesus' death and resurrection, preached at Pentecost, and became a pillar of the Jerusalem church. You know, all things we know about Peter, right? But writing to the elders, he tied himself as a fellow elder, not a superior. He asked them to be shepherds of God's flock, exactly what Jesus had told him to do in John's Gospel. Peter was taking his own advice, and he worked along with the other elders in caring for God's faithful people. His identification with the elders is a powerful example of Christian leadership where authority is based on service, not power. I'm uh, reminded of the experience uh, a colleague of mine had at my former company. He uh, related the story of his first week of employment as a fresh university graduate, all of 22 years old. Well, it was the afternoon and he had found himself in the break room where the employees ate lunch and grabbed a cup of coffee during breaks. Well, when he noticed an elderly man, modestly dressed, who was wiping up spilled coffee from the floor. The man cleaned the dirty coffee cups and put them away and then turned his attention to the tables. Well, fast forward a couple days, and my young colleague was being introduced to management as part of the onboarding process. Well, when he was escorted into the CEO's office, he was surprised to see this elderly man, who he thought was the janitor, sitting behind the CEO's desk. Well, you can imagine my colleague shocked to be introduced to this elderly man as the company's chief executive officer. Now, I always thought um, this was a beautiful illustration of humility and humbleness, and I'm amazed uh, how in line it is with Peter's description of what good leadership should look like in the church. Good re uh, leaders realize they're caring for God's flock, not their own. They lead out of eagerness to serve, not out of obligation. They're concerned for what they can give, not what they can get. And I like the elderly CEO. Um, they lead by example, not by force. And these behaviors uh, have a profound effect on those around them. And here's a case in point. The attitude of humility was not a universally shared trait in my company. Uh, in fact, we had a clever little motto that said, lead, follow, or get out of the way. But there was one person that I worked with who exemplified an attitude of humility, a leader and a follower. He had a true desire to serve others, not himself. He put others ahead of his own agenda. He had self-confidence to serve. He initiated service to others. 
He was humble and not position conscious, and he served out of a true sense of concern for those he managed. People in our company flocked to him for advice and asked to be transferred to his organization. And when I congratulated him on doing something few leaders uh, were ever able to accomplish, and that is to complete a project on time, on budget, and with quality, he said, I can't take the credit. It was my team that did all the work. Congratulate and reward them. God said that he opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And whatever your role, leader or follower, believers are called to be humble. <coughs> well, in section two, Peter tells his readers who were suffering from persecution to humble themselves under God's mighty hand so that he might lift them up in due time and to cast away their anxieties on him because he cares for them. Well, there are a couple of take-homes here that are important in my mind because, as Peter says in the next verses, the devil is prowling around looking for someone to devour. Now, the Life Application Study Bible says it's natural to worry about a lot of things, like our position and our status, hoping to get the recognition we think we deserve. But Peter advises us to remember that God's recognition counts more than human praise. God is willing and able to bless us according to his timing. And if we humbly obey God, regardless of our anxiety over worries and sufferings, he promises to deliver us in this life or in the next. The other thing is uh, when we carry around our worries and stresses, it's a sign that we don't trust God enough to take him at his word. It takes humility to recognize that God cares, to admit we need him, to confess our sins, and to let others, believers, help us in times of trouble. When we don't and try to handle things on our own, we put ourselves in a vulnerable position. Worry and anxiety are destructive forces that can discourage us, you know, weaken our faith, and our resolve to resist temptation. Peter says, the devil is constantly prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, it's common knowledge that lions attack sick, young, or struggling animals. And when we're trying to go it alone and suffering, when pride keeps us from humbling ourselves before God, Satan will attack. But you know what? It's, it's not how you might think. <laughs> this is not exactly roaring. There's an, there's an old fable that illustrates uh, that, and it says that the devil once held a yard sale um, and offered all of the tools of his trade to anyone who would pay their price. They were spread out on a table, and each one labeled. There was hatred, malice, envy, despair, sickness, sensuality, all the weapons that everyone knows so well. But off to one side lay a harmless looking wood shaped tool marked discouragement. It was old and worn looking, but it was priced far above the rest. Well, when asked the reason why, the devil replied, well, because I can use this one so much more easily than the others. No one knows that it belongs to me, so with it, I can find my way into their hearts that would otherwise be unreachable. And when I get this tool into a person's heart, it opens the way for me to put anything else in. Well, Peter says, resist him. And James says, and he will flee from you. So stand firm in the faith and take heart because you are not alone. The family of believers everywhere throughout the world are going through the same thing. So be encouraged. God who called you to his eternal glory will completely restore you and make you strong and steadfast. 
in comparison with eternity, suffering in this life will only last a little while. The road to restoration begins with a humble heart. Believers are called to be humble. Now the last uh, section contains uh, Peter's final greetings to the believers in Northern Asia Minor. In doing so, he mentions a few names. Silas, um, he was one of the men chosen to deliver this letter to the church in Antioch. It's also conceivable that Silas may even have helped Peter write the letter by taking dictation. The she, who is in Babylon, most likely refers to the church, she, in Rome, Babylon, from which Peter passes along greetings. Now, as bad as things might have been in Asia Minor, they were at least as bad for Christians, if not worse, there in Rome. And lastly, Peter mentions his son Mark. Um, this is the Mark of the New Testament gospel, not Peter's biological son. Tradition says that um, Peter um, was Mark's main source of information when he wrote his gospel. Peter did not write a gospel account. That was left to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Peter closes his letter with this brief benediction. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. And though Peter was a great apostle and church leader, he was a humble servant the Lord in everything that he did. He not only was a humble leader, he was a Christ follower who walked humbly with his God. Um, two pastors' wives were visiting each other and sewing their husband's pants, and one wife said, my husband is just beside himself. He does not know what to do anymore. And he's so tired and depressed it, she is ready to give up and resign. Well, the other wife said, I'm so sorry to hear that because my husband has never been happier. Our membership is growing and we're out of our financial burden and we have such a large and loving congregation. Life could not be any better than it is right now. One woman was mending the seat of her husband's pants. The other was mending his knees. Believers are called to be humble. Will you and I choose to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand? Heavenly Father, you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love for all people. Grant us a humble heart so that in all we do, we may reflect your love for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Uh, Kathy Roberts will be delivering the teaching next week, so real treat. <laughs>